Good welcome everyone to History Happy Hour, enjoying Idaho's rivers and waterways. My name is Allison Espindola. I'm the Events and Rentals Coordinator here at the Idaho State Museum. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. The Idaho State Historical Society, which includes the Idaho State Museum, the Idaho State Archives, the State Historic Preservation Office, and the Old Idaho Penitentiary and Historic Sites is dedicated to preserving and promoting Idaho history through programming like tonight and also through on-site visits. In addition to being open for visitors, we are offering a variety of on-site, um, virtual and off-site resources. So to find out more about what we're offering, please visit our website at history.idaho.gov. Now, if you are anything like me, when the weather starts to get warmer, you will find any reason to get outdoors. And if you are looking for something fun to do outside that also helps you beat the heat, this History Happy Hour is for you. Tonight, we're talking about all things river related. Idaho has thousands of miles of rivers. And whether those waters are serene and shallow or fierce and wild, they have been and continue to be at the heart of Idaho. Now, before we jump into the conversation with our panelists tonight, I do have a question for all of you joining us about what your favorite warm weather activity is. So go ahead and open up your chat, share in the comment section about what you like to do in the spring, summer, or fall. And while you're typing away in that chat, I do wanna let you know that that is where you can type your questions for the panelists throughout the evening. Um, I'll ask, um, I'll read your questions out to the panelists at the end of the conversation and I'll do my best. I will try so hard to get them all answered for you. And thank you. I see some great ideas coming through. I'm gonna have lots of fun things to do this summer. Thank you. This is a selfish question for me. <laughs> But perfect, just as a reminder, that chat that you're typing in right now, that is for you to ask those questions to the panelists. Oh my gosh, so many great things coming in through that chat. Yay. Um, but let's go ahead and get this conversation started. The panelists joining me tonight are Sherry Hughes, Redside Foundation, um, former board member and advisor, Caitlin Straubinger, membership and outreach coordinator at the Idaho Rivers United, Megan Nelson, a museum docent at Sawtooth International or International Sawtooth Interpretive and Historical Association, and Aspen Arnold, historical specialist, Sawtooth Inter Interpretive and Historical Association. I want to call you international tonight. Um, we might just go with it. But thank you all for being here this evening. Um, together, they are going to be talking about the history of um, Idaho's rivers, recreation, how you can enjoy these rivers all summer long and beyond. Um, discover what happens when rivers are preserved, um, how guides and outfitters are your best assets out there, and they also need to be taken care of, and also how you can be involved in preserving the natural and cultural history of Idaho's rivers. Now, enjoying Idaho's rivers and waters has been a large part of our state's cultural history for a long time, and Megan and Aspen, I want to start off with you and i um, hoping you can share a little bit about that history with our audience tonight. Yeah, so um, we're going to start at the very beginning, but before, um, just like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Salmon River is the present and ancestral home of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Nimupu tribes, and we are grateful for those tribes who are continuing to work to protect the Salmon River for the people, plants, and animals that depend on it. So I just want to start with that. Um, but to move into that, so Native Americans were the first uh, people to use Idaho waterways for centuries. Um, the bands were often nomadic and fluid, often interacting and trading goods along the river. So these pictures are from the Nimipu um, dugout canoes. And so you can see um, the top is they take and dig, dig out the bark and to create a canoe um, and they are from the north and central Idaho so they used those waterways um, mostly but all over um, and then the um, another tribe is the Shoshone Bannock the two tribes and they are southwest and central Idaho and uh, especially the Ag Agadiga um, band which comes from the relationship they had with salmon so 
the river was full of salmon and they really utilized that source of food. Um, and these pictures come from the National Park Online Archive. So they are available online, but I thought they were very interesting to see. Um, and if we wanna go on to the next slide, um, these are the settlers of the Euro-American settlers. So Lewis and Clark, uh, we've probably heard of Lewis and Clark. They were the first Euro-Americans to traverse the portion of the Salmon River with the help of the Native Americans. And you can see a little map of uh, the a path <laughs> that they went on. Um, the first Euro-Americans after Lewis and Clark who traveled through the region were fur trappers. And they followed the river through rough terrain in Idaho in 1832. They trapped mostly beaver, uh, for the pelt, the beaver pelt hat, which was very popular. And they actually almost um, trapped beavers into extinction, but luckily the hat went out of style. So, <laughs> so we were able to come back from that. Um, and then in the 1860s, gold was discovered in the Stanley Basin especially. And so gold miners rushed to the area and utilized the rivers for dredging. And it was a very fine um, placer gold. And so they used the water and the tributaries of the Salmon River uh, to find that very thin powder gold. And along the way, they built mining camps, which you can see in Bonanza, as well as Custer County. And some of those are very well preserved, and you can go see the whole city today. Um, other places like Vienna, they're a little less, and Satu City are a little less standing, but still amazing places to visit. So, um, it is, has a very long historic um, background for people using and utilizing the Idaho waterways. Thank you. And Sherry, I would love to talk with you about um, kind of your perspective of the background of, you know, waterways and rivers and those details. Well, as uh, Aspen mentioned, you know, Idaho has a long guiding history, starting with Sacagawea, you know, bringing uh, Lewis and Clark across to Idaho. So guiding has always been a part of our state's history, uh, both on water and on land. And uh, they've always, you know, they were the adventurers, the folks who had the skills to be able to bring people into these places that normally scare most of us. And they could take those adventurous types and help them to be in those places safely and also take them to some things that they might not know about or never be able to find on their own. The things that we uh, have that are, you know, we, we take for granted are wonderful resource tools like the internet and things like, and resource books and guidebooks. There weren't many of those around, you know, in your early 20s, 30s and 40s. So you really did need a guide to actually get out into the back country and explore some of Idaho's more remote areas. Uh, that one picture that Aspen posted was from the Middle Fork Lodge. Lodges and back country, you know, uh, home away from homestays were great places where people went into either flew in, they started flying in or boating in or hiking in or riding horseback. So guiding just has a very long history in the state of Idaho. Some of the first, uh, what we consider conventional river trips actually occurred in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, that was when equipment started to be available. Uh, during the war, there was, there was a lot of surplus uh, rafting equipment or equipment that turned into rafting equipment that came, you know, the rubber, rubber boats and stuff that they used during the war. Re that got picked up by folks who had these visions of outfitting companies, not just in Idaho, but also in Utah and Arizona. And uh, that's really what kicked the guiding industry into gear and, and brought us to where we are today. Thank you, Sherry. So Caitlin, I would love to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> as Aspen and Sherry mentioned, there's a long cultural and geological and recreational history of river use in Idaho. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about more recent history and when we decided we should start protecting these rivers. Um, so 
I think, as you mentioned, Allison, Idaho has over 100,000 miles of river, which let that sink in. That's a lot. I think we're so lucky to have this resource literally in our backyards. Um, for most of us, we're pretty close to a river no matter where you live in this state. Um, and in the late 1860s, Senator Frank Church was one of um, our members of Congress who proposed the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So this was a river protection system. Um, and this is a picture of Senator Church fishing, I believe on the Salmon River. So he was an avid outdoorsman and appreciated these rivers personally and knew that we needed to put some protections in place. So in 1968, um, Congress passed the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which protects rivers that have outstanding natural, cultural, or recreational values. And um, the goal of the program was to protect rivers in their free flowing state um, and to maintain water quality in the designated rivers or streams. Um, and the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act requires like, pretty specific river management plans that are put in place to protect and enhance these outstanding values. Um, and so right now in Idaho, we have 891 miles of rivers that are designated as wild and scenic and are protected under this umbrella. Um, and that sounds like a lot, but that's less than 1% of our state's river miles. So Idaho Rivers United and other organizations and groups are working to um, put more miles under the Wild and Scenic River Act and make sure that our rivers are protected so that we can enjoy them and future generations can enjoy them in their natural free flowing protected state. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about the Wild and Scenic Rivers and, and how we've started working towards protections. Thank you. And Caitlin, you bring up really interesting points about, you know, really protecting the rivers and preserving them. Um, I'd love for you to talk about what are some considerations the public should have about, you know, enjoying these rivers, but also doing so responsibly. Absolutely. Go out and enjoy these rivers. First of all, get on a river however you can. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're going to go on a river trip, be it a couple of hours, down the Boise River, or the Salmon River, or a multi-day trip, um, just do your research. And so, you know, check out a map and learn about where, where you're going and learn about potential hazards or areas that, you know, we should be considerate of and maybe need a little bit of extra care around, um, making sure that you have the proper safety gear and know-how for the river that you're doing. And there's so many resources, like Sherry said, nowadays, um, you can go online or go get a guidebook and, and learn about um, where you want to go and what you can do and how to protect it. And then I would say take personal responsibility. So, you know, throw a trash bag in your backpack or on your boat and, and pick up your trash and maybe pick up other trash that you might see out on the river. Um, learn to recognize things like salmon reds. So our amazing salmon in Idaho make their nests um, in the river and we call those reds. And so learn what those look like and learn how to protect them so that you're not stepping on them and, and harming these salmon that have gone on this amazing journey um, from the ocean back to Idaho. So just learn all you can, ask questions. There's great people and great resources who are here to help and wanna make sure folks are being safe and smart on the rivers. Thank you, Caitlin. And, you know, Megan and Aspen are some of those amazing resources and people that we can ask. So I'd love to pass this question off to you. And what are some of the considerations the public should have when they're out enjoying rivers? I think it's important to remember um, that um, the uh, Sawtooth National Recreation Area, which was established in 1972, um, it um, includes the headwaters of the Salmon, Boise, Payette, and Bakewood Rivers. So that's a lot. And it just goes to show just how um, the people who brought that legislation um, forward, they really were considering not just the wilderness and other, but they were considering all parts of wilderness. Um, and so um, when you go on float trips down the rivers, um, just remember how um, you are in very like protected wilderness. Um, so um, yeah, the um, public law that brought um, the Sawtooth National Recreation Area into um, 
kind of like birthed it was it specifically states that the SNRA should protect scenic, natural, historical, pastoral, fish and wildlife values. Um, so of course, recreation is a big part of it. I mean, recreation is in the name, um, but there are so many other things to take into consideration. Um, we are um, really fortunate to have such amazing um, natural resources so near us. Um, it's kind of like this beautiful gem in the center of Idaho. And um, I think it's very important to know that you are simply a guest in a place. Um, and so that's what I would tell people if they were to go recreate on the river. Thank you, Megan. And Sherry, I would love to hear from you. You know, I think Caitlin also um, really kind of was talking about those resources and asking questions and people. So I'd love to hear from you and um, your perspective. One of the things to remember about Idaho rivers is they span so many different environments. And one of the things that I always find interesting is we don't do the same thing in every place. So if you're going into a high mountain alpine environment, you're going to want to act a certain way and camp a certain way. Whereas if you're in a desert environment, which we have many desert rivers here that are just outstanding, you know, your Bruno Owyhee um, type rivers, they call for a little bit different way to act and be. And that's one of the nice things about working with a guided trip is those guides they are the end all in information and how to help you do the right thing while you're on the river. All these trips start with very detailed information by guides who have probably been working on those rivers for several years. And they will take you all the way from, you know, how do we throw away our trash to how do we use the bathroom to all the different things that folks don't think about. Uh, depending on the environment that they're in at the time. And on some rivers, your environment's gonna change while you're on the river. The Middle Fork, for example, of the salmon starts in Alpine and ends up in a very dry desert, high mountain desert environment. So um, it, it's really great to have those, gu those guiding resources to help you do the right thing when you're on the river. You bring up some really great points about, especially the the types of rivers and the environments that you're in and how you respond with those and using a guide is one of the best ways to make sure that you're doing that in a in a safe way for yourself and but also for the river itself. Um, now before we move on to the next question that I have for our panelists this evening, I do have another question for all of those of you that are joining us tonight. Um, I would love to hear from you all about other topics you might be interested in learning about. So I'm gonna pop up a quick poll onto your screen. It should show up in just a second. I'm gonna leave it up for a bit. Please feel free to let me know what other things you might be interested in learning about. If you wanna share something specific or if there's something on there or not on there that you wanna learn more about, please put that in the chat. I would love to hear from you all. Um, you know, what parts of Idaho history in Idaho do you want to know more about? Authors are taking a, a large leap there. I love it. Oh, now it's evening out. It's always fun to watch the poll go up and down. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone who's sharing um, and making sure that you answer that. I really appreciate you taking the time to pop up that poll. If you don't see something on your screen, again, you can type that into the chat. Um, and share away about other topics you might be interested in learning about. I'm going to leave it up for about five more seconds. So sneak your answer in if you can. As predicted, Outdoor Idaho has definitely taken the lead. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end that poll if you didn't have a chance to type in or select your um, your topic, you can always type it in again. But well, let's get back to the conversation. Um, as we get ready to wrap up this discussion this evening, um, I'd love to hear from you personally what your favorite thing to do and enjoy Idaho's rivers. Um, and if you have any suggestions for fun and interesting things that those tuning in tonight can do this summer regarding Idaho's rivers and waterways. And Sherry, I'd love to toss it right back to you. Well, there's so many choices. You know, they don't call Idaho the whitewater state for nothing. And you have choices all the way from a two hour afternoon float 
you know, and lunch or dinner to, you know, your seven, eight day or even longer combo trip, like on a Middle Fork, Maine, if you have the time and can do both those rivers in one fell swoop, there are many, many uh, uh, ways to do that. So um, I always tell people the classic answer, my personal favorite river is the one I'm on the day that I'm there. I just love being on the water and I love being on the river and uh, um, the environment of just what the river does for you, your soul and your heart. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's really an incredible experience and hopefully everyone will get a chance. And I do want to mention that it, it doesn't have to be something that we associate with only wealthy people being able to do. I mean, I, I know there is that idea that it costs a lot to go on a guided trip, but you know, there are so many opportunities there. Are, uh, a lot of our local outfitters offer many, many options to get discounted trips and to do uh, trips for uh, youth groups and things like that. So uh, do your research and you can find a way to get on an Idaho River this summer. Thank you, Sherry. Caitlin, I would love to hear from you. I know you just went paddle boarding this afternoon. <laughs> and I don't know if that is your favorite way or if there's something else that you really enjoy doing. I, I do love to paddle board and I was lucky enough to get to do it as part of my day job today. So that was <laughs> wonderful. Um, but yeah, I, I love to paddle board. I have a dog. So um, I like to take her paddle boarding or um, in an inflatable kayak with me. I live in Boise, so um, on a weekend, you can find me on the Boise River on a paddle board usually, or down on the Snake River. Um, and I'm also learning how to fly fish, which is super exciting and has been a really fun way to spend some time on, near, in a river. You just feel better when you're near the water. So any, I, Sherry, I loved your answer. Any river I'm on is my favorite river. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Megan and Aspen, what about you? Hi, um, so my favorite thing to do on the water is kayak. I love kayaking. I'm more of a sit on top kayak with a nice relaxing um, lake views behind me. My favorite lake is probably Redfish. It's probably, it's a very popular lake, <laughs> but it has just a beautiful history with the Limbert Lodge and um, the SNRA just right there. Um, I love to take boat rides across the lake to that beautiful view of Grand Mogul um, in Hayburn. So I think that is something that if you haven't done, which I feel like living around here, it's something people have probably done before. <laughs> but um, if you haven't, I definitely think it's worth the visit and especially the history and, and the visitor center is not <laughs> too far from that lake. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that it would be actually what I would add on to that is um, one of my favorite places to be um, when I'm up here in uh, Stanley for the summer is um, when I'm not working at the museum. Um, I love to be at the visitor center um, and there are great resources at the visitor center because it's so close. Um, the visitor center is right on Redfish Lake. So an easy walk from if you're at, um, at the marina renting a kayak or anything, you can just walk right up the walking path to our visitor center. Um, and there are so many great resources about how you can rec recreate responsibly. Um, so that is, um, and, and I learn stuff every summer that I'm up here about, oh, you know, actually, I didn't know that that was something that I needed to do while I was in wilderness or, um, oh, that's really good knowledge. So um, that's usually what I, what I like to do or just sit on the beach and read. Perfect. Oh my goodness. So again, more great ideas of wonderful ways to spend my summer. Thank you. <laughs> I hope everybody joining us tonight is also taking notes of all of these great suggestions and ideas for really how to, to engage and interact with Idaho's rivers in such a nice way. Um, I know we have a few questions that have come in from the audience, so I do want to give some time to get those answered before we wrap up tonight. Um, the first one that I saw come in is um, from Connor, is there still a Native American influence on or connected with the waterways within Idaho? Um, so I would love to toss this back to Megan and Aspen because I think you touched a little bit on this in the very beginning and maybe you can expand a little bit more here. Yeah, so today there still is 
a lot of influence um, with the uh, Native American tribes around here in the waterways. One thing that's just barely started is a uh, the Pettit Weir has been um, created and it's ran under the um, the tribes. Is it? It's the Shoshone Bannock tribes. The Shoshone Bannock tribes. And um, it just started in 2019, it started being built and it just barely finished. And it's a very beautiful weir. We just went there um, the other day and they are helping to bring uh, sockeye salmon back to Pettit Lake. Um, previously, it was not very um, plentiful with sockeye, but in the recent years, there have been a couple coming back. And so it's very interesting to see that beautiful uh, structure and you can always come and visit it and watch them do the tagging and um, counting of the fish along it. Yeah, and um, just another thing to note, um, there um, a lot of the sort of like Idaho and um, other efforts in the Pacific Northwest um, to restore salmon populations, a lot of them have been really um, like helped by the tribal influence. There are so many different tribal leaders and organizations speaking up um, for the salmon cause. Thank you. I appreciate that. Another question, and this one, um, I think, Sherry, you touched a little bit on this earlier. Um, a lot of Idaho is considered high desert, yet we have a lot of actual water here. So what is that, um, with all this water, why is Idaho still considered a desert? Well, all, almost all our rivers, uh, we have a few springs. If you guys have been down in Southern Idaho, you know Hagerman and there are some spring fed rivers, but most of our rivers are snow melt rivers. And so once that snow has moved out of the mountains and down on its journey to the oceans, uh, things dry up around here and we have a very high elevation and just the climate that we've always had. And, and of course it's changing, but uh, we live in a very arid part of, it's called High Mountain Desert, uh, where I live in Chalice, there alone are like 300 kinds of grasses that ad have adapted and only grow here. I mean, it's quite interesting. If you want to get into some of the things that are very unique to Idaho's uh, environment types, uh, we have some things that are very specific to Idaho um, because of this irony of having water and also having the dry high desert. Um, so yeah, there's, this, there's tons of research and many, many things. And one of the things you'll notice is if you get too far away from that river and why we have a very large system of irrigation is things dry up if you're a little too far from the river. So that desert is, is a lot of much of it is too far away from the natural water channels to actually get the benefits from that water. You. And this other question I want to ask to Caitlin, and with COVID-19, um, how has that impacted rivers and outdoor recreation in Idaho? Mm, good question. I think rivers have become possibly even more popular than ever um, with COVID. It's a great social distancing activity, um, oftentimes, except for potentially when you're driving a shuttle back and forth. But um, I know that a lot of the boat manufacturers in Idaho are struggling to keep up with the demand um, for paddle boards and for rafts. So people are getting out there, which is fantastic. Um, Sherry could probably speak more to this than I could about outfitters, um, but I know trips were able to go on last summer and, and folks were able to get out on the river safely on these multi-day multi -day trips. And I think it's only improving as we kind of see better numbers with COVID. <laughs> Thank you. And before I wrap up, I know we're hitting right at that 630 mark. So thank you all for still holding on with us. I do want to ask the panelists before I close this up, if there's anything else that they would like to share this evening um, with you all who are tuning in. Um, I don't know, Megan and Aspen, if you wanted to, to take it away, if there's any final comments or 
think just something that we we like to hammer home because we're the Sawtooth Interpretive and Historical Association. So we don't just focus on the history of the area, but we really try to um, just make sure everybody who visits our area understands um, the importance of recreating responsibly on the rivers because they are such vital waterways um, and they're so important to um, history, um, cultural identity for Idahoans, indigenous groups. Um, and that's um, just some, so when in doubt, just research, research all the sorts of uh, wilderness forest service regulations um, before you go camping or do a float trip. So that's one thing I'd like to hammer home. Um, Aspen, if you have anything. Yeah, just um, to go along with that, I think we need to remember that it is, um, it's a privilege that we have the ability to go out on these rivers and recreate on them. And I think that's something we need to keep in our minds that while um, we're having fun, we also need to remember that we need to preserve and recreate responsibly these beautiful nat natural resources. Thank you. What about for you, Sherry, any final parting words? I'd just like to mention there's a great uh, Idaho resource. It's called Raft Idaho. Um, uh, and you can check it out online. And one of the things that that website does is kind of help you decide what kind of outfitter you, you might be looking for. So um, it helps you, you know, because the trips can be, you know, strictly high end fishing, fly fishing trips to family oriented uh, participatory trips. So that website has much information about, you know, how to make a decision. And, and then finally, I represent an organization called the Redside Foundation, which is dedicated to the health and, uh, you know, physical and mental health of guides in the state of Idaho. So we support a lot of resources for guides so that they can be there 100% for you when you take that amazing trip with them. Thank you. And Caitlin, I know we're, we're two minutes over. Thanks for everyone being here. Caitlin, what would you like to share? Yeah, I'll be brief, um, but if you're interested in learning more about river conservation or how you can get involved, um, Idaho Rivers United, which is the organization that I represent, has a lot of resources on our website all about the different issues that are affecting Idaho's rivers today and historically. Um, and you can learn more about how to get involved and how we can help restore our salmon populations and protect our rivers um, at idaho-rivers.org. And we also have a lot of volunteer opportunities if you're interested in volunteering to help protect a river. Perfect, well, thank you. Thank you to our panelists, um, Sherry Hughes, Caitlin Straubinger, Megan Nelson, and Aspen Arnold. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, the Idaho State Museum is committed to providing opportunities like this to share with you, our visitor, while at home or at one of our sites. And one way that we do that is by finding out more about what you are interested in. So just like that poll that popped up, we want to hear from you about your experiences and your interests. Um, we are going to pop a, a, a link to a survey into the chat for you. Um, feel free to take that now, but you'll also receive an email tomorrow with that link. So please take a minute or two to share with us about your interests. In that email, you will also receive links that were mentioned tonight. Um, so you'll have that resource as well for you. So make sure to keep an eye out for that. For up-to-date information about other events, such as other history happy hours um, coming up on July 14th, um, how to become a member, how to sign up for the newsletter, please visit our website at history.idaho.gov or stay up to date on our social media pages. We hope to see you at one of our sites soon and I hope you to see you on the river soon. Have a great night. Bye.